Hello everyone, my name is Doodle. Welcome to my channel. I talk about true crime, paranormal events, and writing while I play Minecraft in the background. Today I will be talking about the Black Dahlia murder. I want to give a heads up right now. Today's video will be very graphic. I'm never, I'm not going to put any pictures up. I never put pictures up, but it's still pretty graphic. The Black Dahlia murder is probably the most disturbing thing I've ever, like, heard researched about. And I've done heavy research into people like David Ray Parker and Blake Libel. Two of, I don't even know if that's how you pronounce his name. I don't really care. He murdered someone. And those are two of the most disgusting criminals who have ev ever lived, who committed two, some of the worst and most graphic crimes ever. The Black Dahlia murder has been described as one of the most disturbing murders in America. This video will contain descriptions of graphic crime scenes, graphic descriptions of the body of the victim, and just murder in general. If that sounds like it will bother you, please click away now. I'm sure there's another video on my channel or on YouTube or somewhere else that will be better suited for you. Take care of yourself first. Also, there are images online. Again, I won't show any of them, and in, the, in my citations below, if you want to go to any of those links, those websites do not have photos, or if they do, it has a warning, and you have to actively click on the photo to see it. But if you go and look it up, just please be careful. Without further ado, let's get into the case. On the 15th of January in 1947, a mother was walking with her daughter when she stumbled upon what she thought was a mannequin. This supposed mannequin was found in a vacant lot on the west side of South Norton Avenue, halfway between Col Col Coliseum Street and West 39th Street. Unfortunately, it was not a mannequin. It was actually the body of a young woman. Who was this young woman? Well, police only had to wait 53 minutes to find out. I don't, I couldn't find out how they were able to identify her so quickly. I think she had an ID or something on her, but I don't remember. I could not find it. So who was she? Well, the body was that of a young woman named Elizabeth Short. Elizabeth had been cut clean in half from the torso, like cleaving her in half, like two separate pieces. She also had a ton of knife wounds all over her and she had a slit mouth cut in my the door just opened that's spooky. okay she had tons of knife wounds all over her despite that there was no blood at the scene indicating that she was killed elsewhere but who was elizabeth short because enough people talk about these murderers i feel like we should talk about the victims because those are the people that deserve our attention and there's nothing wrong with learning about serial killers but we also need to pay attention to the victims also we don't know who did this one so it'd be a pretty short video otherwise so who was Elizabeth Short? Elizabeth Short was born in 1924 on July 29th. She was born in Hyde Park, which is in Boston. She was the third of five daughters. Her parents were named Cleo and Phoebe Short. She grew up in Medford, which is a suburb of Boston. Her dad built miniature golf courses. I'm sorry. Her dad built miniature golf courses until 1929 when the stock market crashed. Then in 1930, he parked his car on a bridge. It was assumed that he committed suicide until later Elizabeth's family received an apology letter, a few saying Cleo was perfectly fine and living in California. Elizabeth's mother worked as a bookkeeper to support her family of five daughters. They were all living in this tiny apartment in a suburb of Boston, which is pretty expensive, right? And he's just like, yeah, I'm just chilling in California. Mm -hmm. Elizabeth had bronchitis and asthma chronically as a child, so when she was 16, she was spent... She was sent to spend the winter winter in Miami. Um, words are hard. She went to go live with um, two of her some of her parents' friends, and she really liked this like family aspect kind of thing. So she came back the next month and the next month, so the next month, the next year. This continued with her living in Miami during the winter months and in Medford in the summer months um, until she was nineteen. And by the way, I mean the family aspect. She grew up for the most part, in a single-parent household. Her mother was very busy trying to support all five of them, so she probably didn't get to see her very often. I'm not saying her mother was a bad mother. She was doing her best, but it's a change, right? So she moved to live with her father, who, um, once she was 19, she moved to live with her father, who was living in Vallejo, California. In 1943, Elizabeth and her father moved to Los Angeles, but they got into an argument, and Elizabeth left shortly after. She moved to Camp Cook, which is now called Vanderburg Air Force, to take a postal service job. Then she moved to Santa Barbara. I couldn't really find out why. She was arrested for underage drinking on the 23rd of September. I was confused by this for a minute, but um, remember, in America, legal drinking age is 18. I'm um, 18. is 21, not 18. Um, but anyway, the juvenile authorities sent her back to Medford in Massachusetts because she was like, 
20, I think, I can, I can, I can math, no, gosh, no, wait, oh, I'm dumb, I'm dumb, I read on Jan- on the fifth of fifteenth of January nineteen forty seven, a mother like when she was found, I was like, oh, that was when she was born. Okay, she was born in twenty four and got arrested in forty three, so that's twenty one. So wouldn't she be of the legal drinking age? Oh no, January, February, March, April, May, June, July, August, September, October, November, December. Right? No. Oh gosh, she was twenty one. Why is she getting arrested? This is so weird. Okay. Side tangent. Anyway, the juvenile authority sent her to Medford, Massachusetts, but she went to Florida instead and would visit Medford every so often. In Florida, she met a man named Matthew Gordon Jr., who was a decorated pilot in the U.S. Air Force. She met him while she was pre- while he was preparing for deployment to China Burma India Theater I- operations. I had no idea what that is. I don't know. Elizabeth told her friends that he wrote to propose while he was recovering from injuries. She accepted, but sadly he died before they could be married on August 10th, 1945, less than a week before Japan's surrender ended World War II. Elizabeth moved back to California and spent the last six months of her life in and around the Los Angeles area. So we're back to the 15th of January, 1947. Elizabeth's body had been cut clean in half, separating her torso and her legs, and she was drained completely of blood. Her mouth was slashed from ear to ear, creating what's called the Glasgow smile. She had several cuts on her thighs and chest areas where chunks of flesh were missing. Like, you know, you know, like, hack at wood or whatever, and the chunks come out in, like, V-shapes? It was like that. Like, ugh. Her lower half was almost a foot away from her, with her intestines tucked behind her, so she was laying on them. She had been posted that her arms were bent at 90-degree angles at her elbows, and her hands were above her head, which is why, initially, the woman who discovered her thought she was a mannequin. She had also been clearly washed off by the murderer as there was no blood at the crime scene, despite the gruesomeness of the crime. Detectives found a cement bag nearby that had watery blood in it. They also found a heel print in the ground near some tire tracks. The autopsy declared that Elizabeth did not have any fractures on her skull, but she did have severe bruising on the front and right side of her scalp. She also had ligature marks on her wrists, ankles, and neck, meaning she had been tied by something like a rope. Her cause of death was hemorrhaging from the flashes on her face and shock from the blows on her face and head. I couldn't find out if she died before or after the other wounds were inflicted, but I hope she did so she didn't have to suffer. But let's face it, with these guys, they're not jobs, right? They, you know? So who told her family? You know, like, your daughter being brutally murdered like that? Maybe you'd want someone to tell you. Well, reporters from the Los Angeles Examiner called her mother Phoebe and said Elizabeth had won a beauty contest. After squeezing every drop of juice from the proverbial lemon, they told her that her daughter was dead. Then, as if it wasn't enough, they took the proverbial lemon juice they just made and sprayed it in her eyes. They offered to pay her travel fees and accommodations if she would come to Los Angeles so she could help with the police investigation. Instead, they kept her as far away from the police and newspapers and other newspapers as they could so they could get an exclusive story. Because newspapers can't get enough. William Randolph Hearst's paper, the Los Angeles Express, and the Los Angeles Examiner sensationalized her case. Her tailored black suit magically transformed into a shirt, t- a short, tight skirt, and a sheer blouse. They framed her as a, quote, adventurer who, quote, prowled Hollywood Boulevard. That's where the nickname the Black Dahlia came from. It was probably based off a character from the Blue Dahlia, which was a noir murder mystery, which are notorious for, at least for the time, being raunchy and kind of risque. Um, so, uh, yeah, yay, good job, newspapers. Um, what happened to report the truth and nothing but the truth? Okay, anyway, on the 23rd of January, 1947, a person contacted the editor of the Los Angeles Examiner claiming to be Elizabeth's murderer. The caller said he was concerned that the case was falling out of public attention and offered to send some of Elizabeth's items to the writer to help keep the story fresh. The next day, a packet showed up at the paper's base of operations. The packet had Elizabeth's birth certificate, business cards, names written on pieces of paper, photographs, and an address book with the name Mark Hansen over the cover. Also, remember, this was a time before digital photos, making it pretty hard to steal a photo from someone. Like, you couldn't just hack them and steal the photo. You had to steal it off of them or from their house. So this was either someone who knew Elizabeth or someone who had the ability to take this from Elizabeth. Hansen was, um, Mark Hansen was a man whom Elizabeth and some of her friends had been staying, like, they were staying in his house, so obviously he came, became a suspect, but obviously never charged. 
at least one other person wrote in the newspaper. They signed the letter as the Black Dahlia Avenger. We, this could be maybe more than one person, but we'll get into that later. On the 25th of November, of November, of November, November that's a new month now. On the 25th of January, Elizabeth's handbag and one of her shoes were reported to be seen in an alley, in an alleyway a little bit off from Norton Avenue, which, if you remember, was by where she was found. Eventually, they were found in, they were, like, eventually they traced all of her stuff to a dump. Because humans are humans, about 60 people have come out over the years and stated that they killed Elizabeth. A detective who worked on the case until he retired, Sergeant John P. St. John, could you just imagine, I'm sorry, could you just imagine being his parents like, mm-hmm, what's his name? What's our last name? Oh, St. John, this name of John. Anyway, oh gosh, do all, no. Sergeant John P. St. John stated, it is amazing how many people offer up a relative as the killer. Elizabeth was put to rest at the Mountain View Cemetery in Oakland, California. Her mother moved to be near her daughter's final resting place once Elizabeth's other sisters grew up and married. Phoebe Short, her mother, returned to the East Coast in the 70s where she lived until her 90s. So, who did it? Well, like I said, we don't really know. It's one of the most notorious cold cases ever. There are some theories, however. Before we get into that, let's state two things that we do know for sure. We know that around 25 of the people who confessed to the crime were actually considered liable suspects. However, each of them was proven innocent in one way or another. We also know several people who do not know Elizabeth claim to see her in the week before her death. So what are the theories? One that I think has some merit to the idea is that Elizabeth was killed by the Cleveland Torso Killer, who is also sometimes called the Mad Butcher of Kingsbury Run. This video is already longer than most of my normal videos, so I'm not going to get into the details of it, of, like, that that murderer and, like, that guy. But if you want, uh, but if you want I'll do a video as, about it later. As you can probably guess, the main link betwe- between the two was the whole torso thing. But police look, the police looked into it and said there was no relation between the two crimes. However, a lot of people still think that there's something there. I personally think this could be an example of a copycat who never got caught, but um, I'm not a detective. I'm just me, so that's not my job, so I'm not going to, like, say anything. Another case people think could be linked to the killing and dismemberment of Elizabeth Short was the killing and dismemberment of a six-year-old girl named Susan Degnan, D-E-G-N-A-N. I can't talk. Um, And sadly, Susan was murdered in Chicago in the year of 1946. Susan was killed by a man named William Harris, who's also known as the Lipstick Killer. Captain Donahoe of the L.A. Police said that there was a likely connection between the Black Dahlia murders and the Lipstick murders, which I also don't really have enough time to get into. Let me know if you want me to cover that one in the comments. One of the biggest pieces of evidence was the fact that Elizabeth was found on Norton Avenue, three blocks away from three blocks west from Degnan Boulevard. Remember, Susan's last name was Degnan. Personally, I think this is a little, reaching a little, but what do I know? I'm not a detective. Um, That was cited as, like, the big thing, but what I think is the big thing is the letters, okay? Um, A ransom note from William William Herons um, for Susan was extremely similar to the ones written by the Black Dahlia Avenger. Both letters used random capitalization throughout the words and sentences, and ways that didn't seem to have a pattern to make sense. They also have extremely similar misshapen P's, and one of the words is a literal copy of the other. Could this be someone who saw a picture of the lipstick murders and was like, hey, why don't I write write my letter like that? Maybe, but I mean, who thinks of that? At this time, it was before like there were TVs and like TVs and radios and like, oh, look at all this true crime. It was kind of like, oh, Oh, I heard about that. But of course, there's always a possibility. I personally think there is a lot of evidence and merit to this theory, but I don't really know. Like, I'm, I'm not the detective. I'm, I'm not a detective. I'm a 14-year-old child. What do I know? Anyway, I won't get into the movies and books and shows and whatnot because this video looks like it'll turn out to be at least 15 minutes and I don't want it to go too long because I understand that. I like listening and sitting down to these long stories about it, but I understand that that's not plausible for a lot of people. Anyway, as always, citations are in the description, and like I said at the beginning, anything cited in there you can go to without having to worry about seeing any pictures. The only thing is there's one website called Crime 
crime scene database that has photos, but you have to actively click on them. But if you choose to research this case, again, there are pictures and there are some websites that do not have that. So please be very careful if you do. So what do you think? Was the Cleveland Torso Killer the, the one who did it? Could it have been William Herons? Or was it someone else entirely? Is there another case you want me to cover? Let me know in the comments down below. Please consider liking and subscribing if you liked this video, as it really does help me a lot, and it takes time, it takes, hmm, I can read. It takes me a lot of time to research and film all of this. Have a great evening or afternoon or morning or whatever time it is that you're watching this. This is Doodle, signing out.